my name is Talia Buford. I'm Assistant Managing Editor here at ProPublica, and I'm going to let um, our other two uh, panelists introduce themselves as well. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Ginger Thompson. I'm Chief of Correspondence at ProPublica, sort of a hybrid management editing reporting role um, on our masthead. Welcome. And I'm Alex. I'm a Deputy Managing Editor. I run uh, some editors and reporters on investigative projects, and the three of us uh, designed uh, this program and are really excited to talk about it. Yeah. Um, and so just so that folks know kind of what the run of show is for today, um, we're going to tell you a little bit about the program, um, you know, who's eligible, how you'd apply, um, what you would ex expect. And then um, we're going to try to answer some of the questions that you've already submitted ahead of time if you had submitted those beforehand. But if you have questions, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And you can answer, I mean, put in questions there at any point, um, and we'll try to get to those um, at the end of the conversation. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Ginger to tell us a little bit about um, the start of this program and the genesis of it. So, you know, what what inspired this program is, you know, one being a leader in DEI is a, is a pillar of ProPublica's strategic plan for the next five years. And one of the places where we as an organization are least diverse is in our editing ranks. And part of the reason for that, you know, isn't, isn't going to be a surprise to most of the people on this call. Investigative journalists from diverse backgrounds are few and far between, and it's worse among investigative editors. Um, newsrooms simply don't encourage um, journalists from diverse backgrounds to pursue this kind of work. Um, and so often when we at ProPublica go out in search of editors, we've had a tough time finding candidates with the experience it takes to successfully do this kind of editing. Um, and so, you know, for a long time, we sort of complained about it. Um, and a couple of years ago, we decided to do something about it. And we created this training, which is meant to either bolster the skills um, of people who are in sort of investigative roles now, typically early investigative careers now, or, you know, editors who don't have the word investigations in their title, but who want to think with more of an accountability mindset and who frankly may not be getting opportunities to do investigative editing in their own newsrooms because they too don't have the skills or the background and this will hopefully give them some of what they need if, if they're interested in pursuing a career in investigative editing. The components of our program, it's, it's a year long training um, and it kicks off with an editor boot camp um, that is held over four days at our offices. It's actually five days, four and a half days um, in our offices at New York. The training is led by our editors from, you know, their sessions with our editor in chief, our managing editors, our DMEs. Um, and, and many of our senior editors. Um, and then that boot camp, um, and I can talk more about the details of the boot camp, but it's essentially meant to sort of, it's, it's organized in a way to take participants through the production of an investigative project from the story idea to sort of helping your reporters have the right tools to do investigative editing, to managing the first draft of a huge investigative project, um, and then to kind of exploring different ways of storytelling, whether it's rolling investigations or long um, deep dive narratives. Um, uh, you know, after after the boot camp, and it it's called a boot camp for a reason because it's a lot. Um, there's a lot of real work involved. Um, um, at, but after the boot camp, there are monthly virtual trainings with other editors and other leaders in our newsroom, including our legal staff. We have we do a session on you know um, how to protect yourself legally, how to protect your investigations legally. You know, you know, our our lawyers are really good at not just telling you what you shouldn't do, but how to make sure that you protect yourself to do the most ambitious work that you can. Um, and then after, in, in the middle of those virtual trainings, each um, participant is assigned 
a ProPublica editor who works as their mentor for the year and who also meets with them monthly to talk about anything from navigating their careers, managing their own supervisors, managing their reporters. It's a, it's a, it's a mentorship that is really designed by the participants. And we try to listen to what our participants say they want in a mentor and then pair them with a ProPublica editor who we think would best be suited to, to serve their interests. So, um, so that's just a brief overview of the program and why we're doing it. And I'm happy to take more questions um, as we go along. Yep. And so I'm gonna go over, you know, uh, who is eligible to apply for this great program that uh, Ginger just mentioned. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Alex to kind of talk a little bit more about um, our, our ideal candidate. Um, and so, you know, the eligibility requirements, you know, this program is open to all, um, but we are especially encouraging people from traditionally underrepresented communities to apply. That means women, people of color, LGBTQIA plus people and people with disabilities. Um, as Ginger mentioned at the top of this conversation, you know, this is designed to try to change the face of um, investigative editing, um, and those groups are often very um, underrepresented um, in newsrooms today. Um, as a part of the application, it's also important that um, participants know that they will be asked how their inclusion in the program will help to diversify the editing ranks of investigative journalism. In terms of age or um, uh, age requirements, we don't have an age requirement. Um, one of the uh, questions I saw uh, come in is, you know, are we looking for older candidates such as those in their early 60s? Um, we are, we have, we are agnostic on age. Um, we're open to anyone who is interested in, um, a journalist who is interested in bolstering their investigative editing chops, um, whether you be 25 or 65. Um, and, uh, but we are asking for people who have a minimum of five years of journalism experience. This is a program for journalists um, and for um, reporters, editors, people who are in working in newsrooms, um, not folks who are necessarily in academia, maybe that comes later, but for right now, we're focusing on folks who are um, actively producing journalism. Um, there are no, um, this program, again, is open to everybody, but our goal is to improve also the diversity of um, investigative editors in the United States. Um, and so, yes, you are eligible if you live in the United States, but you need to have some sort of uh, um, connection to a US-based publication, um, and uh, then we'll kind of focus our participation accordingly. Um, Alex, I'm going to pass it over to you to talk a little bit about um, last year's participants, because I think they were a great example of um, kind of the kind of people that we're very interested in supporting. Yeah, we uh, had 159 applications, uh, and we just were just blown away by the applications. They were really fun to go through. There was, it was overwhelming. Uh, the quality of candidates that were out there. And we wound up, we had, we, we were originally going to do 10 slots, but we ended up having 11. Uh, we just had to take 11 folks. Um, we wound up taking all editors, um, you know, and I can get into that in a little bit. We are open to reporters. Um, but uh, I think, you know, we really want our investment uh, in folks to pay off immediately as quickly as possible, right? So, uh, you know, taking on 11 really great editors who are already trying their hand at accountability work with their reporters, we know they'll be able to implement the stuff they learn as quickly as possible. That does not say that we would not take a reporter. Um, we would like to know if it is a reporter do they have accountability experience and do they have actual traction and momentum toward an editing career? Are they player coaching? Are they serving as the lead reporter on projects? Have they been talking to their bosses? Are, are, they, are they taking on night editing shifts, right? We really want some evidence that um, if we were to train a reporter to be an investigative editor, that they will be practicing their investigative editing skills uh, relatively soon. Uh, again, there are a, a small number of slots for the um, amount of people that are interested in. So we just want to uh, choose those who are uh, most likely going to uh, create the biggest impact as soon as possible. Um, so uh, 
you know, these editors, by the way, came from a very diverse range of publications and backgrounds. Uh, let me pull up the story here to give you a quick, uh, quick sense. So we had a managing editor from Type Investigations um, who works uh, at a high level with, uh, with freelance reporters. We had a Metro editor at the Boston Globe. We had a managing editor at the tiny paper in Uvalde. Uh, we had a managing editor at New York Focus, which is a uh, nonprofit that covers the state of New York. Uh, we had a bureau chief for Chalkbeat Detroit. Um, we had a, a deputy health and science editor for the Washington Post, whose official job was not doing investigations, but whose team was doing some accountability work. We had the executive editor at Gimlet Media. Uh, we had uh, a, a, the a accountability editor for the Idaho statement, a statesman. Um, we had a managing editor at Shelter Force, which is a, a nonprofit that um, aims to inform and hold accountable those working towards more, more, more just and equitable, equitable communities. We had the national editor at Capital B and a senior editor at ESPN, uh, their investigative and enterprise unit. So in all of um, the portfolios we look for, has this person, do they sh demonstrate that they have a heart for accountability reporting, right? Have they, as a reporter or as an editor, tried their hand at doing stories that matter, that are in the public interest? Um, are they kind of, uh, do, are they, you know, and, and do they make a, a, a good argument for how they would apply the skills that they learn to their job. So, you know, anything else that I'm missing, guys, that that we look for in in candidates? Yeah, I, I don't I don't think so. I think you know we've we've gotten actually a handful of questions from folks about eligibility. Um, you know, people wondering if they're in public radio, um, if they are an investigative producer, or they do investigative documentaries. Are those the kinds of people that we're looking for? A lot of our training. So, a lot of our training does focus on writing. At the same time, there is a lot of um, coaching on story choice, on uh, reporting that could be useful to folks in broadcast, who could be useful to folks who um, in other mediums. And in fact, we did have at least one audio person. Uh, so we would indeed consider um, you know, folks from non-writing backgrounds. But I do think that folks from writing backgrounds would, there is more for you. In this I, program. I, I would only add to that, Alex, is that, you know, some of these broadcast organizations now have really big digital operations that are producing investigative stories. So if you are an editor in that space, um, this program could very well um, translate to, to what you do and be useful for what you're doing. The person who joined us from Gimlet um, last year was an audio-based reporter, but they did a lot of long form storytelling. It was a heavily text process that his work involved. And so I think if you, you know, if you think about it that way, it is very much a text based um, training. Um, and so I'm not sure it, it applies exactly the same way to a daily um, small local tele or local television um, producer, news producer. But if you are a producer on that station's website and you are working on text stories for the website, particularly investigative pieces, or you just want to do more investigative pieces on your website, then this could be something that would apply and be useful to you. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you can hear from, you know, the kinds of organizations that we um, selected for last year um, that all kinds of publications are eligible. So yes, a small community newspaper is absolutely eligible. Um, if you are a freelancer, um, we would require you to have a, um, you know, some, there'd be a slightly different uh, application process, which I would go into for you. But yes, there is a possibility for that as well. Um, and so I'm going to walk really quickly through the um, application process. Um, so on our website, um, which uh, Connor has uh, put into the um, into the chat, uh, a link to the application, we ask for you know kind of all of your general um, information, um, and but we really want to know um, you know kind of one why you're well suited for this program. Again, thinking about how your participation is going to add to the diversity of investigative editors um, in the industry overall, um, we want to know um, why 
you want to be a part of this. Um, and then also any editing experience that you might have. We also asked a couple of other questions just to kind of get out, you know, what you're interested in learning from a mentor um, and the skills that you'd want to develop. After the application um, is submitted, um, which uh, it's due on March 11th at midnight, uh, so 11.59 p.m. Um, on March 11th, um, we'll review those and um, we'll be selecting a handful of folks to go through um, a, a Zoom interview with us. And so then we'll deliberate and um, figure out the, the final 10 or uh, 10, 10 people that we'll be um, you know, selecting for participation. Um, so I want to, you know, hear from, you know, Ginger and Alex, um, you know, for people who are thinking about applying, what do you think um, they should think about when they're approaching the application if they've, you know, maybe worked primarily in not an editing capacity, maybe they've worked as a reporter or, you know, as some of these other folks who have been maybe, you know, radio producers or TV producers or things like that, but they're interested in making the leap to editing, how should they approach their application? I mean, I really think what Alex said is spot on in that what we want to see in reporters um, or non-editors, journalists who are not yet editors, is some real sort of either game plan or effort that is underway um, that is moving them towards an editing role that, you know, that they that they are interested in these skills because they have a plan for applying them sooner rather than later. Um, that they can demonstrate in, in like what Alex said, are they doing night shifts? Uh, have they already edited a project? Are they player coaching for their team? Anything that they can tell us that shows exactly how and why they want to um, use these skills would be would be very helpful because there are a lot of editors applying for this thing, for this program who can, you know, who have a clearer way of demonstrating that they want to, want to use these skills or how they'd use these skills now. And so that is what I would recommend reporters really think about. How can they show us their the, the, the momentum toward editing? We're still um, asking folks to submit letters of recommendation from their managers, right? Yeah. So if you're a reporter, I would have your manager say, hey, this is someone who we would, you know, who the organization does see as on the path to editing. Uh, I think that that would go a long way. Yeah, like with these skills, we could see them being an editor in the next two or three months or six or whatever, but we would like them to move toward editing. And if this helps them sort of do that, we'd be grateful to ever be. Yeah, and I apologize for missing that part. Yes, we do require a letter of recommendation. And that letter is not only um, to ensure that, you know, your organization um, supports you attending um, for this week and really being able to devote your time um, to the training, but also um, because we want you know, to help make a pathway, hopefully, at your publication and to say, hey, you, you know, Talia has, you know, done this training and when she gets back to her newsroom, um, we want to put her to use, right? And so, um, again, hearing from uh, your supervisor or someone who is um, in a position of authority to be able to say, yes, we really support this person um, attending will be um, really great. Um, I'm going to um, answer a couple of these questions that we have that are coming in. Um, you know, uh, I think that, you know, our, our participants from last year's cohort um, seem to be from well-known city and national publications, our um, editors from smaller papers such as Alt Weekly's Viable Candidates. I would say that I don't know if that's necessarily a fair characterization of all of our, um, all of our folks, but um, we are open to um, publications. If you are producing journalism today, then you are eligible. Um, by the way, I love Alt Weeklies uh, because they do great investigative journalism. So please apply if you're from Alt Weeklies. Yeah. Um, all right. So if you're already in an investigative editing position, what would make a candidate stand out? Ginger, Alex? You know, I think examples of of some of their work, you know, it, descriptions of the, the kind of work that they do. And, you know, there's this question that has come up in other times that we've talked about this between learning on the job versus 
doing a boot camp like this and is one better than the other? And I would say they they kind of complement each other. And so, you know, it's sort of like a doctor. Sometimes when you're a doctor and you're just doing one surgery after another, you don't have time to step back and either learn new ways of doing things or thinking think strategically about how you're doing the work you're doing, why you're doing it this way, what your reporters might need that you're not always thinking because you're just running and gunning all the time and so the opportunity to step back and explaining why the opportunity to step back and really sort of think strategically about your work think sort of long-term learn new ways of doing things you know spending time with some of the best investigative editors in the country you know how that would you know shape what you're doing now how that would benefit you I think would be useful in in making you stand out Okay, awesome. Um, the selection process, how long does it take? So our um, our application is due March 11th, um, and I believe that we would be notifying folks by the end of April, early May, because the boot camp is in June. So um, it's uh, you know, a little bit over, probably like six weeks or so, um, something around there. If I'm doing my math correctly, maybe a little bit less, um, but somewhere around that process. But we will be in, in contact with folks. And, um, you know, if obviously if if you have some sort of um, other time constraint, you can reach out to us. And we can always give you an update on how things go. Um, all right. So uh, are we planning on doing this again in the future? Absolutely. We are doing this again in 2025. Um, so okay. even if this is uh, not the year for you, um, we will be able to, you know, have you as a as a possible candidate next year. Um, all right, so uh, one question we're getting, I don't think I'm qu currently qualified, but I'm interested in the program. Would it be better to apply now and then try again if I'm indeed not ready yet or wait until I'm in a better position to participate? Alex, Ginger? I think, no. I think it's, about how much, it's about your time, really. Um, if you don't think you're a great candidate for us now, um, I, I don't think that applying uh, applying does you any benefit, right? Um, what do you think, Ginger? Look, I feel, I think what you said, Alex, it depends on your time. If you have time to apply and you don't, and it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And we, you know, we'd be happy to sort of, when we write people back, we typically say, if you want to talk to us about what it was that you still need or things that we thought were gaps in your experience, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. If it's, a, if it's a time crunch and you just don't really have the time to invest in this yet, because I don't want people to think these applications aren't serious. They're serious and we take them seriously. And it really is our first sort of look at you and, and we get a lot of applications. So you want to spend time to make sure you're putting, you, you know, as much as you can into it. If that's not you right now, if that's not the kind of time you have when you're not even sure you're the right candidate, then I think, you know, only you can judge. If you have the time to apply and you don't get in, it might be a way for you to get some answers to what it is you need to apply. So. Um, Absolutely. Um, and so just for folks who might be coming in late or, you know, cycling through and who uh, may not understand where we're getting all these questions from, there is a box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A and you can drop in any questions that you um, have there um, that um, you'd like for us to answer. Um, okay, so um, one of the um, one of the questions that we got is, you know, will this program help participants find new employment after the program is? Is that what this program is about? That That is not what this program is about necessarily. Now, I will say that some of our uh, participants have since changed jobs, but it wasn't because of work that we'd done. This is, you know, what, what this, at this point anyway, what this program focuses on is trying to give folks skills that perhaps will enhance their abilities to go out and get, we hope that would enhance their abilities to go out and get other jobs or to advance their careers where they are. Um, but, but it is not our role to, we don't make that a part of the program. You will, along the way, meet a lot of ProPublica editors and it will give you a network and a, and a place to, to, to talk about your own career moves and to discuss 
new opportunities and things like that in an informal way, but that is not a formal objective of our program. Yeah, and just to note that if anybody um, has to dip out, um, we will be posting a copy of this webinar on our YouTube page, on ProPublica's YouTube page. Um, so feel free to um, access that there um, after this conversation. Um, Alex, Ginger, um, can you tell us like, when you're thinking about this program overall, how would you measure the success of it? Um, what does it What does it look like if this program is successful? Alex? I would, I would want to know that the editors have learned something and are actively applying what they learned to what, you know, what to their work, right? I mean, look, this is a bit self-reported from the folks, but we do develop a relationship with them. Um, in our year of mentoring them. And we, it is a success when, when we see that we have made an impact on, on how they think and how they do their jobs. We don't have any uh, stricter metrics than that, I don't believe. Again, I will say some of our candidates, some of our participants have moved on to other jobs, bigger jobs, and that's kind of cool. I wish we could take credit for it. It's just we've had some talented folks in the room, but they do say to us that, you know, that this program has changed the way they think about their work. And that's to me is successful. Yeah. Um, one of the questions that's come in, and I can just reiterate for, for this person, you know, what are the characteristics of the ideal candidate? We do have a list. Um, if you scroll down on our application um, of frequently asked questions, including what an ideal of participants um, will have. And so those are, you know, a minimum of five years of journalism experience, either as an editor or a reporter doing work with an investigative accountability focus. Um, a strong grasp of the basics of editing, storytelling, structure, and framing, experience managing a team of journalists or a complicated multi-pronged reporting project, and an accountability mindset. Um, you don't have to have been on an investigative team, but we are looking for people with an eye for watchdog reporting and editing. And um, for folks, obviously, who um, are joining this call now, you can always uh, rewind, I guess, um, on the YouTube page and hear um, Alex's great answer to that, that shows a little bit more about what we loved about some of the candidates from our last um, our last boot camp and what we'd be looking for from people going forward. Um, all right. So uh, let's see here. We've got a lot of really good questions. And if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A um, box. Um, oh, um, this is a, a, a fun one. Um, are you able to talk about how ProPublica defines accountability journalism? Alex and Ginger, I'll let you guys take that one. So it's, it's impact is a sort of multi-layered thing, right? Um, there is no one kind, but certainly the, the classic kinds are stories that change laws, stories that change um, the way governments work, stories that change an agency, stories that expose harm and who's responsible for the harm or what's responsible for the harm. Um, sometimes those stories actually force agencies or governments or processes to be changed, legislation. Sometimes they just start a, a conversation in the place where these stories are happening that also sort of move, um, you know, change the way this the, the process works, alleviates the harm that's happening to people or mitigates it somehow. But, but at its core, and Alex will have a lot more to say, at its core, it's, it's exposing harm and it, it's explaining who's responsible. Um, for that harm, naming names. That was far better than what I planned to say. So that's good. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to keep going with some more questions. Um, what are the dates? I'm taking some of these easy ones first. What are the dates um, for the boot camp? Right now, we have the boot camp set for June 2nd through June 6th. So that's the first week in June. Um, and again, this is um, all expenses paid. We bring you out to New York. We put you in a hotel. We pay for food, all those different things. Um, is it possible to select an editor and a reporter from the same outlet or should the outlet choose one applicant overall? I'll give my answer and then um, Alex and Ginger can let you guys. I, so one, I don't necessarily think that the outlet needs to choose who to, to move forward, um, but it is probably unlikely that we'll select an editor and a reporter from the same place. Um, I think that uh, sometimes organizations 
will bet on, you know, one application um, and say, oh, I'm going to have this one person and, and maybe that person will go through. Maybe there might also be somebody that something that we see in that, you know, reporter that I also wanted to go that um, would be um, interested. So if you have the bandwidth, um, I would encourage all of them to apply. And um, Alex, Ginger, if you guys want to add anything. Perfect to that. answer. Perfect answer. Got it. Um, all right. So can you talk about some of the other aspects of investigations that are covered in the program? I heard um, legal considerations um, being mentioned as one. Go ahead, Alex. So, um, we really take you through the entire life cycle of an investigation. Uh, we have uh, the day, the first day starts with the idea. What is an investigation? Um, how do you, you know, hone and find investigative stories? Um, then we get into reporting, right? We have a great panel with um, some great reporters about how they do their work. Uh, we talk about investigative reporting management. So when you're an investigative editor, your job starts not when you get a draft, but in the very beginning. Um, so how do you manage the investigative reporting process? Um, we take a couple of edit tests, but it's, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, you don't get graded. Um, you actually get to do an exercise that applicants for jobs at ProPublica do, where we'll give you a draft um, that needs some work and you tell us you know, what you see and we coach you through that. Um, there's a thir The third day is very much devoted to uh, editing, actual editing, putting the investigative to in investigation together. So what do you do when you get the first draft? Um, we talk about, um, you know, editing a multi-part series, how to run that process, uh, structure. We talk about traditional structure, narrative structure, uh, and we also get into ethics. We get into um, engagement reporting. Uh, so that's just a sample of, of what the week has, has in it. Great. All right. Another question that's come in. Um, I'm a freelancer reporter editor who is also starting a media company with a narrative accountability focus. What would you need from someone like me? Um, I guess my answer would be all the same things we need from everybody else. Um, we need you to um, submit an application. Um, and uh, in terms of, I guess the, the one question would be for the um, the letter of recommendation. Um, for freelancers, traditionally what we um, encourage them to do is to submit a letter from somebody who's familiar with your work, uh, maybe an um, editor at another publication that you've worked for, um, you know, something, someone like that who can speak to the work and, and your um, ability to, to become an editor or your, um, you know, likelihood of becoming an editor, that kind of thing. Um, and so that would probably be the best route um, for someone who is, you know, more on a freelance um, route. Go ahead. All right, um, let's see here. So are there any particular tips for people who applied last year and how to stand out this year? We did get a lot of applications last year. Um, and should they put more focus on steps that they've made within the last year to grow? I, I think that would be terrific. If they applied last year and they're going to reapply, one, I would flag that you applied last year because I think showing that interest is important and will stand out to us. But also say, and here's what's here's what I've been doing since I last applied, right? So you know, we knowing us, we'd go back and look at your other application and look at what you're doing now, and I think that would be useful. So please flag us if you applied last year, and um, and please talk in some detail about what's changed and how your interest in this program has only you know increased. Got it. Um, and so again, if folks are coming in and they have questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A. Um, uh, this is a, a pretty good question. Um, you mentioned that participants shape what their mentorships look like and what they and the editor they're paired, to focus, uh, paired with um, focus on. Can you give examples of what participants have decided to, decided to focus on in past year, just past year? Well, this is the only, we've only done this one year, this is our second year doing it. So can you give examples of what um, folks have uh, focused on with their mentorship? So we, we, we did, uh, we're gonna do mentor pairings a little differently this year. Um, 
But, uh, you know, there was somebody who wanted to talk to their mentor mostly about leadership and management challenges. There was, but may, there might have been someone else who really wanted to use their mentor as an editing sounding board and talk about the craft. So, you know, it, it really, you will have at your disposal somebody who, you know, might be willing to look at drafts with you, might be willing to bounce um, story ideas with you. But also if you're dealing with a, particularly challenging staffer, you know, they might help you manage that issue. Um, so really there is a range um, and it's really, you know, led by the mentee to get out of their mentor, whatever they need from them. And we also use our mentors as, you know, um, channels of communication to ProPublica writ large. So if a mentee is having an issue at their organization and they need and that engagement support. And they just want to talk to one of our engagement reporters to get some ideas for how to do something in their newsroom. You know, the mentor and the mentee can arrange a conversation. Um, if they're having a legal challenge, if they're having a research challenge, you know, these, these participants have access to ProPublica for a year and we try to really connect them with folks. If, if we've got a resource that can be useful to them, um, we, we try to, you know, connect them to those. And readers. if they have, and if they have a story that they want to partner on with ProPublica, exactly. that exactly. mentor is a really useful bridge in helping, you know, exactly. exactly make that partnership happen. Yep. I'm going to just happen to a couple of um, questions from folks who submitted um, ahead of the webinar. Um, so one question, um, thinking about work samples, can you share an investigative project published in the previous year that you admired? I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Um, is there a, a clip that you're like, oh, this was a, a project that, you know, you admired? You mean outside of ProPublica? Uh, I guess so. Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll go outside I, of ProPublica. I mean, there are a lot of really great investigations that, yeah. that, that we liked. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, there are some really great local ones coming out of the South, this, um, this series of stories in, out of Alabama by this father and son who, you know, reported on this one police department in this tiny part of Alabama that was like stopping drivers all the, you know, just one after another so that they could finance. And they built this police department that used to have like three officers, had some huge number of officers and they had these military grade equipment and they were just basically, you know, hoisting sort of the funding of and the growth of this police department on the backs of the residents of this part of Alabama. It was just a very smart, you know, and really what they did is they went to the courthouse and they started seeing all these sort of tickets for things. And they started getting tips about, yeah, everybody in town's been stopped by this police force and charged some ridiculous amount for tickets. So that's a and then they won the local Pulitzer, right? They won the local Pulitzer <laughs> I love that investigation. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. just to, you know, kind of bring it back to the work samples, I think, you know, we are not expecting you to have to submit Pulitzer Prize winning stories. Um, what we're looking for is, are you doing accountability work in your publication? What does it look like at your place, like wherever you are, whatever you're doing for your community, what is that? It doesn't need to look like a ProPublica investigation or, um, you know, Washington Post -like investigation or anything like that. It needs to look like an uh, investigation or accountability work, really. I think that's more what we're looking for. Are you asking the questions? Are you finding the answers um, that you need to hold um, the people in power to account in your communities? That's what we're looking for. Um, I, go ahead. I, I, look, I worked for a local newspaper for uh, 12 years and um, there was great accountability work that came out of the, not the investigative team, right? Like you can cover cops from a, an accountability perspective or you can cover it from a you know, regurgitate police press releases perspective, right? And so is there kind of a hint of accountability in, you know, maybe asking questions about that police involved shooting or asking questions about even the new police chief and accountability look at the police chief, right? Same thing with government, same thing with education. Are you a Metro reporter who is just giving a skeptical eye to things that, that indicates that um, you care about these accountability? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions about the content. So um, some folks are asking, you know, does it focus on um, audience engagement or social media? Um, we do have a session on um, engagement reporting, but engagement reporting at ProPublica is very different um, than audience engagement at a lot of other places. And um, engagement reporting at ProPublica is more crowdsourced investigations. Um, so think things um, like... Um, um, now I'm blanking. So Idaho, we just did a um a big series um in Idaho um where it was uh crowdsourcing um visual evidence of the deterioration of schools um across the state, for example. So that's a thing where we use the power of the public to fill in gaps um in official reporting to in order to do our investigation. So again, not audience, but more so in using crowdsourcing and the power of um of people uh, to be able to do investigations. Um, we also um, are um, adding in um, some some additional sessions about, you know, uh, well, actually, no, that's that's not true. So the question is, let me just read the question. Um, how do you keep long form projects on track while also juggling day to day duties? I think that's a that's a one of conversation we'll have <laughs> in the in the boot camp. Um, but I guess, um, Alex Ginger, um, you know, for folks who aren't at an investigative outlet, you know, is that something that we will talk about at the boot camp and, you know, kind of tell us a little bit about that? Very yeah. much so. Yeah. I mean, I mean most um, of our applicants, right, um, Alex, are from news organizations where that's what they do. That's yes. So we really, really want this program to be applicable to your organization and we recognize that not every organization is, you know, everything long form, everything long term, right? So um, baked into our curriculum is one and gun investigations uh, and grappling with that, you know, how do we juggle our time? How do we, you know, how do we do it? So that's very much um, what we're teaching. Yeah. Um to another question, um, which is, you know, do we have anything related to cross-border investigations during the program? Um, we don't get that specific um, with our investigations and then with the training. Um, we're really giving you the tenets of what are the components of an investigative um, project and how we do it at ProPublica, centering findings, centering accountability, centering the ability to have impact with your reporting. Um, and so whether or not you're doing that within your local community or whether you're doing it at a cross-border investigation, um, the tenants remain the same. Um, all right, uh, Ginger, uh, actually Ginger and Alex, I can ask you both this. Um, what's helpful about this being a boot camp versus learning on the job, Ginger? You mentioned a little bit of this um, earlier, but just to reiterate for uh, the folks in the back. You want to take a crack, Alex? This is a retreat, you know? <laughs> I mean, but it's a boot camp retreat, It's a much right? better way of it. <laughs> Yeah, it's a boot camp retreat. Uh, so you're going to get to hang out with people who are yours in, in your same situation. You're going to get to build relationships with us. You're going to get to think about nothing other than awesome investigative editing for a week, right? So obviously, uh, learning on the job is extremely important. And um, we, you know, we pay mind to that for the, 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 curriculum that we design throughout the year. This is why we don't focus on data until you're back in your newsroom. This is why we don't focus on research until you're back in, in your newsroom. But we find that the, the boot camp is a special experience um, that, you know, it's great to get people together um, mm -hmm. and to talk about this stuff. Anything you want to add, Ginger? No, I think that's perfect. Okay, great. Um, again, folks, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A. Um, that's actually all of the questions. Uh, oh, oh, somebody just dropped one in. All right. Uh, so I'm an editor for an educational publication with an audience of young readers, mainly middle to high school students. I have a personal and professional background um, in investigative reporting and interested in bringing accountability journalism to um, our unique audience. Have we worked with this demographic in the past and any recommendations for an application like this? Interesting. So you're an editor for an educational publication with an audience of young readers, mainly middle to high school students. I think I would have a, a couple of questions about this. One, are you, um, as somebody who also started in local news and wrote, wrote for my teen section of my school, of my um, local newspaper, um, I'm wondering, is it affiliated with the local newspaper? Is it affiliated with, you know, some broader journalism organization? Or is it um, like a, a, 
like a high school, um, like an academic newspaper sort of situation. Um, if folks have very specific, um, you know, scenarios or circumstances, you're welcome to email me at talent at propublica.org. And I'm happy to um, get into the nuances of your particular application in your particular situation. And so for that intent attendee, if you could just email us at talent at propublica.org, we can um, dig into that a little bit more and, um, and try to get you an answer. All right. So um, can candidates propose their own stories? Um, uh, can candidates propose their own story? So this is not um, a investigative story producing program. This is a training program. So you do not have to produce an investigation at the end of this. We will not be editing an investigation at the end of this. This is in order for you to learn um, the uh, the skills that you need in order to do the work that, um, that uh, we're talking about here. All right. Um, so let's see here. Um, what I'm hearing, what I'm seeing is uh, a lot of folks who are very interested in their very specific um, situations. And again, if you have a very specific situation um, that goes beyond the um, criteria that we talked about today, again, a minimum of five years of professional experience doing accountability journalism, actively working at a um, a news publication um, and and the other things we mentioned, you know, accountability focus and, and those sorts of things. Um, one, you're welcome to email us at talent at propublica.org. Um, but I think we're we're going to not go too far into um, individual situations um, here uh, in in this uh, in this situation. So if folks uh, let's see here, let me check the field. Okay. All right. Great. Um, well, right now, um, I, I can give it a, another, um, you know, another couple minutes just in, in case some folks have um, any any last questions. But while we wait on that, Ginger, Alex, anything that you would want um, potential applicants to know or think about or um, any, any last parting words you'd want to say? We also have fun during the boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> we actually have a lot of fun. The conversations are intense. Um, we do put a lot into it. You know, our editors are super excited about being involved in this. And so they come like ready to like fill you with all this great sort of experience and knowledge. And they also love hearing from the participants. So it's a very, you know, sort of dynamic and fun um, experience. But we also you get to meet a lot of the folks in our newsroom, you get to know a little bit about uh, ProPublica. We're going to hopefully, I may be saying the wrong thing, but I think we're giving, building in more time for you to actually enjoy New York a little bit. Um, so, uh, so like Alex said, it's, it's a retreat and, um, and, and a fulfilling experience, a rewarding experience. We hope it has been for our folks in the, uh, in the last year. Yeah. Alex, do you want anything you want to add? I think what Ginger said is spot on. And to me, the two things I'm most looking for is um, our number one, I, really, I, I think I can boil it all down to how quickly can you help us achieve the impact of increasing the diversity of ProPublica's investigative editing, right? Like, we want, we really want this program to be as impactful as possible. And so the likelihood of you getting us there uh, will be the factor that is probably measured most strongly um, in, in, in the kind of selection of the candidate. 